Uh, we're going to kick off um, our webinar this afternoon. It's uh, uh, really great to be back with you again um, for another one of the LEO webinars that we're running monthly now. Um, today we are talking about video and animation, uh, harnessing the power of moving picture uh, for learning in lockdown. Uh, and I'm joined by uh, my colleagues, uh, Frank. Frank, are you there? Um, hello. Hi, Frank and Bridget. Hi, hi Bridget. Hello. Hi. Uh, and uh, in the background, we have Lindsay, who is our producer for today. So I won't make Lindsay say hello, but um, I'll thank Lindsay in advance for all, all her support and what she's doing. If any, if any of you have questions about um, sound, picture um, or any housekeeping, just uh, um, put, put anything into chat or into questions and Lindsay will be monitoring those. So um, we are uh, going to have a few question sessions during this and moments. And so please feel free or in, I encourage you to put in uh, questions in the questions fields. Um, and I will be looking at those as we go through and picking up and trying to answer as many as we can of your questions. Um, we have a couple of poll questions as well, which will pop up onto your screen at the appropriate time. And uh, so we will we'll move on um, quickly and, uh, and get on with our, our webinar. Uh, we'll, today we'll be looking at um, video and animation and uh, it's a really interesting area which we have been involved in um, for many, many, many years delivering uh, with a media team of our own um, uh, video and animation for learning. And uh, so we have our two leaders in each of those fields today, which is really exciting, um, who can introduce themselves to you in a second. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, video and animation in the context of lockdown, uh, what that means, um, hints and tips for recording video um, and creating your own video and working with vendors and teams um, at this time, uh, and also animation and what that can bring to us in the, the, the learning context and some, some um, of the practical tips and knowledge that we have about delivering at scale, speed, um, using um, vendors and professionals to, to create animation or indeed um, creating it yourself. So um, those are the topics we'll be covering. And uh, I will just introduce myself. I'm really the chair today. Um, I am uh, n not nearly as much of an expert as uh, Frank or Bridget in their areas. Um, however, I would say that I did start out making training video uh, way back. And so it is a, um, a media that is close to my heart. And even back then, uh, as we moved into digital delivery of video, uh, there, um, and at that time, the bandwidth uh, limited a lot of what we could do. Uh, there was a real feeling that one day we'd be able to use video properly again when we had what what has become broadband and ways of delivering um, really high quality HD video easily out to all of our learners. Um, and I'm really glad to say that as 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 every few years goes by it becomes easier and more flexible and cheaper to create content and um and more scalable which is all, always exciting and always adding to the the value of what we do my quote here is we learn fastest when we're dropped in at the metaphorical deep end um uh it it really is a moment of change which i'll reference in a second um and a moment of learning for all of us um uh, but if there is if there is uh, a, a silver lining to what we're all going through, it is that we are we are engaging with with media in different ways. We're delivering virtual learning, uh, um, and uh, and doing that very successfully and um, and and in a very agile way. It's very exciting to see how 
we are deploying media and channels in different ways. Uh, so that's me. Um, I'll hand over to, to Frank to introduce himself. Hi, Frank. Hello, thanks very much, Andrew. I'm uh, Frank McCabe. I'm Leo's um, executive producer of Moving Image, which means uh, I do all sorts of things, but I'm uh, responsible overall for the, the quality of our Moving Image output. Um, most of my time is spent um, writing and directing and producing dramas, but I am also involved tangentially in animation, um, along with Bridget, um, who's, who's kind of in charge of that area. Um, so my, my remit really is, is, is video. Um, I'm also a playwright away from Leo, or I was before lockdown. I'm not sure what's going to happen to that, but we shall see. Um, and my quote is, um, writing is easy. You just stare at a blank piece of paper till your forehead bleeds, which I, I think originally is Woody Allen, actually. Very good. Um, and we'll come back to Frank in a minute. Um, hi, Bridget. Hello, I'm Bridget Sutherland. I'm the lead animator at Leo. Um, I've been with Leo for about eight years now and actually founded the animation department, helped put it together. It used to be just me, but it's grown exponentially from there, as you can imagine. It's just become more and more important to have a strong animation and moving image element in your learning nowadays. So uh, it's been a pleasure watching that grow and, and having our team expand. We have a few permanent members of staff who I oversee and I make sure, again, that the quality is there and that we're delivering the learning messages and that uh, we're delivering things that are really exciting. It has to be exciting. So that's why I've got the quote, why do the mundane when you could do magic, which is a John Crick for Lucy quote. He was the um, director and lead animator of Ren and Stimpy and a very challenging director he was too, by all accounts. But I, I think it's a common thing in e-learning that people come across sometimes very dry content and animation is a real opportunity to bring it to life and make it exciting and get people engaged. So. That's why I love what I do, and that's what I do. Thanks, Bridget. I think it's fair to say that your team and Frank's team are as busy as ever um, at the moment. Isn't that true? Definitely. Yeah. And we're yeah. wrapping up for an extremely busy time. It's kind of, it hasn't really let off since the start of the lockdown for us in animation, and it's now accelerating at quite a pace. Yeah. Same. Very good. Yeah. 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 Um, and of course, um, we'll be exploring what that what that means and what that looks like for both Frank and Bridget, Bridget um, working in this kind of lockdown um, environment. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, we are very lucky to be part of Learning Technologies Group, and um, it is a group of a dozen, a dozen companies that come together all um, in the area of digital learning, talent management, and support of growth and um, uh, and change in individuals and organisations, and uh, you will see uh, a number of brands there on the screen here. Some of which you may recognise. Uh, I won't go into them all, um, but there are um, platforms, uh, um, leaders in their field, people fluent and open LMS. Um, you'll recognize, uh, I should imagine, you'll recognize GOMO, uh, you know, world leading um, e learning authoring tool and very close partner of Leo's um, uh, since, since uh, the beginning of, uh, of, of Leo. And um, you will see um, Instilled, which has come out of GOMO in the last 18 months as an, a learning experience platform very much focused on um, social uh, learning and video, which is very exciting. I urge anybody who has not seen that to, to look it up. Um, our colleagues in Rustacy and Watershed, um, leaders in the area of data and analytics and learning record store uh, at Watershed, which is something we feel very passionate about. Um, and in amongst those, you'll see uh, three um, service partners, Preloaded, who are a developer of uh, virtual reality, um, augmented reality, and games, uh, serious games, based in in London, close partner of ours, and then top left there, Leo and uh, Leo GRC, which until uh, ten days ago was known as Euclea. They are governance, risk, and compliance specialists, 
and have now joined up with the Leo team, which is very exciting and uh, being rebranded. Um, Leo have been um, in this business, we say, for 20 to 30 years. Um, uh, we're born out of two of the um, Europe's leading um, digital learning specialist companies merging together. Um, and we uh, talk about the key areas of what we do as a strategy, digital learning strategy, uh, technology and platforms associated with delivering to anyone, anywhere, anytime, rich, uh, appropriate and um, uh, high quality content, whatever that may be, whether it may be traditional e-learning, as you, as you may call it, or the kind of media we're talking about today, uh, or indeed face-to-face -face blended learning programs and experiences, and delivery, which is really a nod at the fact that it, we don't just create the stuff and, and hand it off. We're about making sure it works, working with our partners to make sure it delivers um, into their learners and does what it needs to do, measuring the effect um, and being able to work closely as we continuously improve uh, what we're doing with, with, our, um, with our partner um, clients. The last uh, six months has been um, a, a very interesting and, and obviously very, very difficult time for, for many of us in, in, in business and in life. Um, we came into uh, March, April this year and saw, I would describe three phases of um of of our of our work and um the challenges that we were being asked to support in our clients the first one was very much um help i need to move all my face-to-face -face learning into virtual classrooms as quickly as possible can you help us do that um and uh we were we were able to move really quickly to support a lot of our clients in doing that um as we predicted, many people became very good uh, very quickly at delivering um, great webinars and, and virtual classrooms. Um, and we all learnt, we, having been dropped in the deep end, we all learnt very quickly um, what, what a good virtual learning experience feels like as, in terms of an event. But then the next phase was, but how do I make that more profound as a learning experience? Because just another Zoom um, meeting or a PowerPoint presented in um, a webinar form isn't really good enough for, a, for a, um, a profound piece of learning and change that I need to deliver into my organization. So there we are talking about um, blended learning journeys and a whole lot of really interesting topics that we have a lot of webinars, um, we've been delivering a lot of webinars on over the last few months. Um, the third phase really is is the is a lot of our clients and partners are thinking now about well if this is the, going to be the way we're going to work now um, how do we do this at scale at speed um, we don't have more budget um, so how can we uh, deliver uh, this as a new way of um, of learning and receiving learning and delivering learning um, for the future and what do we need to put in place for that. We're very much in those second two phases um, right now and it's a really interesting time but it does play, these two play absolutely to where we have been and what we've been doing for, um, for many many years and that is delivering digital learning that works and in amongst that mix of the, the best channels and the best media is um, uh, has always been the use of moving image. Um, whether that's uh, us, um, uh, and I say I use this in a in a in a weird um, context. Traditionally, going out and shooting things, uh, even this image looks strange with people so close to each other without wearing masks. Um, but you know, there's our team on location filming a drama, um, and th we would have had these happening. Um, you know, uh, every, every week of, of, of the year, we would have teams um, shooting video, and Frank will talk to us about that. Or we'd be creating, as Bridget says, um, 
animation of all sorts that may be standalone, may be part of e-learning, but these are really important channels and media to us. So, uh, and they remain so right now, are really, really important. Um, and uh, however, there are changes um, in the way we're working. And so what we wanted to, to discuss today is how um, the current working situation affects both of these, these channels. Before we kick off, I want to ask a, a couple of very quick questions. And one is um, the following, before lockdown, to what extent did you use moving image in your learning? Uh, and uh, moving image being both video and animation of any sort, really. So Lindsay, if you could bring up the, the question. Um, and I can repeat, repeat that, so here we go. Uh, before lockdown, to what extent did you use moving image in your learning? Um, always, often, sometimes, hardly ever. So if you could choose one of those, we'll, we'll just get a feel for how it used to be, if you like. Um, we'll wait for a few more votes. And then let's have a look. Um, let's have a look at the results of that. There we are. Um, so we've got uh, sometimes uh, fifty-four percent, um, always fifteen percent, which is great, and thirty-two percent hardly ever. Uh, let me ask another question. Um, before we reflect on those, um, and that is since lockdown, to what extent has your use of moving image changed? So, Lindsay, if you could bring up that second question. Um, are you using more, um, same as before, or less? Got a good load of um, answers there. Shall we bring up the answers, Lindsay? Looks to me as if uh, this is really, really interesting. So nearly 60% of you are, are, are doing the same as before, but we have 40% of you using more moving image than you were before, and only 3% using less. Um, which is really, really good good to hear. And in fact, um, it connects very strongly with what we're hearing elsewhere in the industry. The Fosway report that came out about six to eight weeks ago uh, put video at the very top of the list of, of important media at, at this moment in digital learning. Um, and that is absolutely supporting both of both that and your answers here are supporting what we're experiencing in our team. So um, I will hand over to Frank, first of all, for any thoughts about that particular um, that particular poll result and, and, and also over to you to talk to tell us about video in lockdown. Thanks very much, Andrew. Hello again, everybody. Um, yeah, I think those results mirror what we're seeing, what we're seeing on the ground. I mean, if you'd, you'd said to me that um, in the middle of March, you were going to take away our ability to go and film things, I would be busier than I have been for three years. That would have made no sense. But it's actually that that's been that's been the truth. And that's been the case. Um, so we're going to we're going to look at what we've done in order to stay busy, really, the, the, the kind of work we've done to replace what would be conventional filming. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about change, but we're going to begin with something that's that stayed the same and should stay the same. Um, Andrew touched on it earlier. One of the things we've seen um, during lockdown, rather than timelines becoming elongated and things being delayed, we've actually seen a lot of urgency from clients in terms of their of what they need and when they need it by. So people replacing other uh, methods of delivery uh, of, of learning um, and needing just in time kind of right now solutions to kind of urgent problems. So there's been real time pressure the last five or six months. 
And in those circumstances, it's it's easy to um, forget the fundamentals. So this is what you're seeing here is our uh, the way that we prefer to conceive a video. So we, we tend not to start with jumping to a particular format like we want a drama about it. That's a you know to some degree that's an arbitrary decision really. We're trying to apply a rationale to that decision making before we get into committing to a format or a type of media. Because once you've made that decision, it, it tends to be tends to tends to stick if you know what I mean. So what we're doing here on this on this slide really is we're asking where the learning needs to land with the viewer. Is it heart? Is it hands? Or is it head? Now, heart tends to be around uh, um, culture and behaviours. It can be um, quite quite emotional. Some of these some of these dramas they're playing into the emotional part of us, um, and the dramatic um, possibilities of that are, are huge and very interesting for us. Um, the kind of unspoken human interactions that are only semi tangible that, that work really well. Um, in this area. Hands are almost the opposite of that really, they're concrete techniques and processes, they're to do with the imparting of practical information um, to a workforce. And head is about um, changing people's minds, creating buy-in, so it's internal comms, internal marketing, um, corporate stories, uh, and and talking around debates that might be going on within an organisation. So they're about a, a, a mindset. Really. And, and the thing about this approach is that it's actually um, agnostic in terms of, of the format. So we, we can easily and have created dramas that fit into that head category or documentaries that go into the heart category. And it's kind of interchangeable, really. So it provides a kind of wider palette than just the first thing that comes into your head is we'd like a drama. Well, let's talk about you know, what we're trying to achieve um, in the first instance. And it's really easy to circumvent these kinds of thinking and, and processes when, when there is time pressure. So we've tried to, we try to cling on to best practice. Our chief technology officer, Piers Lee, uses the phrase a lot, uh, go slower to go faster. And this is one of those things. Be rigorous, and actually in the long term, you'll get where you're going um, quicker. Thank you, Andrew. So now let's talk about change. Um, obviously, the, the fundamental kind of modus operandi of, of what we do every day in, in, in video uh, just stopped dead in the middle of March. Um, so we've had to come up with uh, all kinds of new formats and new ways of thinking in order to deliver to our clients the things, the things they want. And we, we're basically looking at having three options in, in response to any brief, really. We're either going to film it super securely, we're going to film it remotely, or we're not going to film anything at all. And actually, we've got a really good example of something that involved nobody leaving the house whatsoever, which we'll show you later. Um, so the first of those, film it securely. Um, I think it's still worth going through this stuff. We, this, these, these procedures and caveats may be in place for only a couple of months, or it may be significantly longer than that. Just like you, we, we simply don't know. So at the moment, um, we are comfortable um, shooting in certain contexts and not comfortable shooting in others. So fully functional workplaces would be a no. So a, a, a working factory, for example, we wouldn't shoot there. But we might shoot that when it's empty at night or the weekends or early mornings, um, something like that. Um, busy scenes with three or more actors we are, we are not keen on, um, but monologues and scenes with two actors, we think are okay. Distance and travel is a thing. We don't want to be putting crew and actors in a van for six hours to travel somewhere. Um, that doesn't feel particularly safe at the moment, so somewhere that um, we can all get to that's nearby um, is, is a good idea. Um, and confined spaces, uh, again, probably not at the moment. Larger spaces and secure outdoor spaces. I think we've taken the view that outdoors with some precautions around that is, is kind of okay. And the interesting thing is we've we've been able to, with a bit of thought and a bit of consultation with the client, we've been able to tailor projects that were going to be normal shoots into this rather more sort of streamlined or straight-jacketed version. So it is doable with a bit of thought. You can adapt what we had in 
say, January, February, and um, that we were going to shoot March, April, um, we've adapted a couple of those things into um, a safer, more biosecure um, way of working, as we call it. So biosecure filming is about, really, distance and control. So control is things like ensuring that you have a deep clean of location before and after shooting, very clear signage on exits and entries and uh, one-way systems, telling people not to use elevators, um, scheduling really strictly so that people know when they should arrive, know when they need to leave and people aren't crossing over. Um, a distance, we, we are able to work on the basis that if you imagine we were shooting in uh, an empty office, <clears throat> We can have the director in one room with a walkie-talkie and uh, a monitor. We can have the client in another meeting room with a walkie-talkie and a monitor. Uh, and only the people that need to be on the kind of floor where the shoot is happening are, are, are actually present. So we can do these things remotely. It takes a bit longer, it's a bit more frustrating, but it's perfectly doable. So it's, it, the key to this really is it, it, it's proven to, to be taking a lot more time than normal to work the logistics of this stuff out. So we need to give ourselves more time up front to make sure that all these processes, all the documentation, all the thinking is done. There's a couple of examples of things we're doing at the moment. We've actually just shot um, some documentary for Toyota at various uh, plants in North America, um, Kansas, Mississippi. Um, we shot when uh, the, the factories were empty um, and the scheduling and logistics I know from from what I've been told by the by the, the guys in America was just you know hugely time consuming, lots of to and fro with the client. What time does what time does the car park empty? You know, is there likely to be anybody in here at this time? Where can we go? Where can't we go? All those things are, are, are just, just take a long time. Um, and we're currently planning um, a biosecure drama at the Leo offices in Brighton for Sellerfield. Our offices are closed until uh, January at the earliest. So we've got a really familiar, controllable environment with a set of processes already in place um, to make sure that we can shoot that as securely as we can. So that's our first option. We are starting to see, you know, planning for what you might call more conventional shoots coming back again now. So and we're going to be doing more than that. Some of them were deferred from earlier in the year. So we may well be very busy out and about um, doing this kind of thing. Our second option is filming remotely, which has uh, actually been really interesting. And I think a lot of the things we've discovered, a lot of the processes and ways of working that we've implemented, we're going to keep uh, even when um, you know COVID-19 is no longer a problem. Um, actually, they're, they're quite neat, some of these solutions. Uh, so we've been forced into uh, thinking of how we do this uh, a bit more cleverly. So filming remotely basically puts the onus for the actual capturing of the footage on the people who are being filmed. So that may be uh, actors or it may be contributors from your organisation, SMEs, um, or senior um, stakeholders in a project. So we've got some um, examples of here, the kind of uh, kind of formats that, we, that, we've, that we've created. So we've, we've, we've translated a, a, a kind of um, a, a traditional normal script that took place in a meeting room and that became a Zoom drama, which is the top left. So it's the same meeting, it's just happening virtually. Um, and there's a kind of a nice nod to the current situation there as well for learners. It's a sort of recognisable thing. We've all spent hours on these things now. So uh, that is nice and recognisable, really. Um, top right, we, we have asked people from our, our client company to um, video themselves, and we've created a really dynamic, kind of snappily edited um, montage of their responses to certain questions. They just pop out of that. Um, that sort of jigsaw pattern there um, and give us their answers that works quite well and then we've got these i really like these we've got some monologues here which are internal monologues so they're quite quick to do because there's no there's no dialogue on the shoot the dialogue is done by voiceover afterwards so you can actually that's quite a time efficient um way of creating content you can do a lot of that in a day because you're not ask, asking people to speak it's it's a voiceover artist who's speaking sort of pre-scripted, um, pre-signed off um, script. So 
we've done probably six, seven, eight of these types of things, um, and we've learned an awful lot about how how they um, should work, really. Um, so in general, if you wouldn't mind, Andrew, thank you. Of course. Um, Frank, yes. one of the people is saying that we're getting um, slightly um, digitised audio from you. So I've turned oh. my video okay. um, sure. If you turn off your video yeah. uh, camera, then that might help with that. OK, apologies. Uh, reminder, anybody who has any questions, please stick them in the question pane uh, and we'll, we'll be able to have a look at those in a second. OK, great. So hopefully that's better on the audio. I've turned off my video now. Thanks. Um, so uh, we have um, three phases to these self-shot uh, things. So preparation is even more important when you when you're filming remotely. Um, the capacity for things to go wrong on a shoot doesn't change when you're filming remotely, but your ability to fix it does because you're not there. So you've got to head all kinds of things off at the pass as early as you can. So this preparation phase, we like to do a couple of days ahead of a shoot because it just gives us time to sort out any unforeseen issues. Um, so it's a kind of walkthrough really of everything. So it's about the lighting in the background. Where are they going to be sitting? Are they in the kitchen? Does it look better in the spare room? Um, we prefer people to shoot on their mobile phones to webcams because the quality is so much better. But of course, we need to make sure they've got the right level of storage on their phone. So just doing that a couple of days in advance really helps. Um, and we send them out documents about how we'd like them to frame things um, and, and where they need to send the footage, direct links, things like that. So on the day of the shoot, um, we ask people to set up their mobile phones. We are on a web meeting with them. So we can see everything they're doing, we can direct them, uh, we can ask them questions if it's an interview, but they're not looking directly at us in the webcam, they're working to their own mobile phone. Okay. Um, so once they've framed up, we can ask them to send us a, a, a short test sequence via WhatsApp, and we can say, that looks great, or move your chair a little bit to the left, or just turn that light off a bit, you know, the one in the corner, uh, until we get the setup that we're happy with, and then we can go ahead. And finally, the transfer, um, we ask um, people to send us all the takes via WhatsApp and the ones we like, we send them a link in a document in advance and they click that link and that file goes straight into the correct spot in our uh, sort of um, network, our, our file system. So it's been a, it's been a bit um, fuck it and see at times, but we've, we've ended up quite quickly coming to a pretty streamlined process on that and it works really well. Thank you, Andrew. So um, the advantage of working like this is it's actually, uh, it, it's really quick and it's, it's pretty inexpensive actually. Um, the downside to that obviously is that there is a, there's a technical quality issue in terms of lighting and sound and so on. Um, and it's, it's just that those things are not comparable to a conventional shoot. You're rather hemmed in by um, being able to use one actor at a time unless you're lucky enough to cast a married couple, which we almost did a couple of weeks ago. I, I, it's a shame that didn't happen. That would have been really nice. Um, but of course, everybody's living separately, so you can only really film them one at a time. So there's things about timing of conversations. You're, you're, you're actually recording somebody without the other half of those conversations happening. And that, the timing of that is difficult um, to get right. Um, and we don't have a lot of flexibility in the kinds of scenarios or locations we can film in. So. Um, as I said earlier, you know, something that's got five people in a meeting room, we can't do. Um, so, you know, we have to do that as a, as a web call at, at home. So, um, it does have, you know, it is, it is doable. It, it, these things are quite engaging, but they don't have the kind of specification and the variety um, that we would normally expect. So, alternatives to filming, in other words, not filming at all. Um, I just want to show you uh, this example. We, we're doing a lot of this, actually. This is a, a, a piece of what we call mixed media. Now, this was part of uh, a bid for um, a, a military contract, which um, LTG is part of, along with five other organizations. And we made a six minute sequence uh, as a kind of um, high energy, sort of um, uh, high end um, uh, um, 
pricey of our of our very complex detailed solution um, for for people to see and it's it's it, this is available on uh, online it's on the it's on various websites and LinkedIn and things like that so it's perfectly okay to share this with you so top left we've used what we call dynamic stills there so we try and avoid in these sequences having any any moment at which things just go still so they're photographs there but actually they may have some parallaxing on them some 2.5d as we call it they may fade in and out or there may be a pan across them and the text there as well is is dynamic so that's 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 moving or fading in or, or crossing over or whatever it may be and it being a military project there was tons of stock footage with a huge library um, of actually some really nice stuff so we wove some of that into the story as well um, and then the bottom right is an interesting one self-shoot we sent 12 contributors uh, a t-shirt as you can see there and a microphone for them to plug into their phone one of the big issues with self-shot stuff is audio it's just the quality is not there unless you use a mic so we posted loads of stuff out to them uh, we joined them on web meetings and we directed them through that and we got 12 subject matter experts um, reading a short piece to camera which we've woven in um, and the final bit bottom left there is animated elements again we've got some photography in there bottom left um, but that that diagram um, moves and expands and the bit that we're talking about on the voiceover uh, comes to life as you see it so this mix of stuff if you can get an overall style and tone that suits everything this stuff feels seamless and it's really dynamic because there's something new happening all the time it's really nice um as we finished on animation uh that's the point at which i'm gonna hand to bridget but via andrew i think um do you yes. ask any yes. questions thanks thanks frank I, I, um we'll move on to bridget quickly but uh, there there was one question yeah. um was is the editing process any different in lockdown um no it's ex exactly the same um right that's all, you know that's all done in front of a, you know in front of a screen it is exactly the same and you then send out um digital versions for clients to review and make that's changes right. yeah 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 it's working exactly the same i mean the pre-production and post-production the, the the first third and the third third are, are kind of untouched really it's just the capturing of the footage in the production phase that, that's, that's been a challenge, obvious reasons. Thank you. And any more questions anybody have, please put them in questions panel and we'll come back to them at the end if we have time. So uh, as I hand over to Bridget, I've got a question for everybody, which is um, regarding animation. So if you needed an animation for your learning tomorrow, how would you create it so this is very much aimed at the people who at the beginning of this said yes we do animation and we're doing more of it um how would you create it would you use a vendor hire an animation um team professional animation animators or whoever or would you do it yourself through purchase software um and so on and uh, if you don't know anything about that then you're just about to find out something about it so do use uh the um poll uh, make your put your answers in and we'll have a look at the answers now um really interesting it looks as uh, very much as if three quarters of you uh create animation yourself which is really great and um the rest do um hire animation teams so um you will have for those of you who 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 use professionals and vendors you will have um certainly come across people like bridget who know who've been doing this for years and years so uh over to you bridget to tell us a little bit about animation sure i just like to say that's really interesting i mean just five or six years ago maybe that would have been really different it just shows you how how far this software has come to make it accessible for the end user and and for that software to be developed how popular animation is now as a learning medium across the board not just in e-learning but youtube channels like well oh, so many youtube channels i could list so many so i'll just dive into a little bit about the power of animation for learning and why it's such a a huge tool for e-learning so it works in three ways 
I think, primarily. The first one is it is basically show and tell. Animation can break down a complex and abstract process into simple parts. So it can explain situational processes like hazard spotting or show a process that normally can't be observed directly, like how the heart works, for instance. So show and tell is a really old and powerful learning tool, but it's especially those situations where we need to see something that we can't see directly that we have to illustrate it and conjure it up in front of you to explain how it's working. So that's one of the main ways. The other thing is animation makes memorable stories. In addition to communicating the content, we can give messages greater meaning and impact with story. So a strong narrative enhances engagement and makes it memorable and shareable for people, which is really important because we've all got a strong story to tell. Uh, lastly, animation employs engaging identity. So visual identity is an important aspect of all communication, especially now more than ever when, you know, even kids are aware of their brand identity on Instagram or whatever their social platform is. So using your brand and your story to drive the look and feel of your animation makes communication clearer and more relatable for people. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the process that we go through with animation. The process remains the same regardless of the budget really um, and it has also remained unchanged since uh, the pandemic because uh, it's all about communication between the team and luckily for us we've been able to do that through the internet we don't have to be there in person so first of all we would have kickoff with the client and establish what their needs are um, any sort of visual ideas that they may have i always encourage clients to just bring any inspiration to the table at all it could be something they've seen in a film or something they've seen in an ad, uh, anything at all, because it all helps feed kind of the feeling that the animator will conjure out of the animation for them. So that's one of the, that's kind of the most important thing, getting the communication right with the client in the first stage. And then the second most important thing in the whole process is the concept lab. This is where our team gets together and kind of bangs their heads together and nuts it out and just tosses around ideas it's usually a very short meeting because it doesn't take long to understand the needs of the client but i'm always amazed by just having the script writer and the animator specifically in the same room when one person says one thing and the other person will pick up on that thread and come up with other ideas based on that before you know it, you've got kind of a, a really good direction to go with and what's also really important is that the whole team knows the story we're trying to tell so nobody's going to arrive halfway through and be kind of up in the air and not know what they're supposed to be communicating. It's really important that client, internal team, everybody knows what this animation is supposed to be doing. So after that, our learning designer will go away and write a script and then we'll have an internal review of that and amends and then the client will review it. It's really important to have that internal review just to make sure that, again, we're all aligned as a team on how we're communicating through the animation. And the script is usually just voiceover on the left, rough description of the actions on the right, um, but the actions may all change at the storyboarding stage, which comes a little later. So while scripting is happening, we can start on the art direction and we'll do um, mock-ups, or we may do a proof of concept to actually show exactly how the figures or whatever the subject is, is going to move, um, especially for clients who aren't sort of familiar with using moving image, that can be really useful. Once they've signed off on that, we'll go into storyboarding, we'll produce a storyboard with a fully realized image for each of the kind of key frames of the animation, with script on the left and direction on the right for what's going to happen. And the reason we produce that fully mocked up is because it's much easier to change things at storyboarding sta stage than it is at the animation stage, where things become much more complex when you're dealing with, in the temporal dimension with many, many layers of assets. Um, and again, that will have internal review and amends before it goes to the client for their review and amends. And then lastly, the animation process follows the same thing really and by that stage usually amends are very very minimal it will just be a couple of script tweaks usually where they just want to shift the wording a little bit or shift the position of something and that's kind of the process in a nutshell it's the same for a budget animation for a high-end animation and it's been the same throughout the lockdown process for us so I thought I'd just discuss a little bit about styles as I said before it's it, it can really change the tone of your animation and it can really cover anything. I mean, beyond just, a lot of people just think of cartoons, but 
it can invoke the entire range of printed and moving image. It could be like newspapers, like photos. It could be like hand drawings, like a flip book. It could be very technical, 3D. Um, there are just so many options. Um, these are just like a few thumbnails of, of pieces that we've done. Um, I think when we produce our AD, we kind of try and communicate what each style can communicate to people. So I often say that, that hand-drawn elements and like cutouts and um, whiteboard animations, they can often give a sort of a friendly and accessible feel because it makes you feel like you're right there with somebody and they're explaining it to you. So that that's kind of a nice sort of style to go with if you're looking for that sort of tone. But sometimes clients want things to be very sort of you know, advertising style, slick, no, kind of very corporate and they may not have any illustrated styles in their branding and they just want to use photos. That's fine as well because we can use techniques like 2.5D, which kind of pops out each layer of the photo into a diorama and we move a camera around it and you get this sort of illusion of depth, which you will have seen in billboard ads in, in the underground and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, if you have more abstract content, then we will go into more abstract things like, um, yeah, sorry, Andrew, um, we'll move into more abstract things like infographics using symbols and iconography. Um, sometimes, you know, the symbols don't have to be representative. They can be completely abstract. There was, uh, there's an animation on the right that's just a dot with lines coming out of it. For that whole animation, we just use dots and lines coming together to kind of form communities and connections and then break away and express what the audio was talking about. So, I mean, it really can be just about anything. Oh, the last one is typography. We um, occasionally do just typography animations, which can be really impactful and really strong, but they're usually best when they're short and the script is really powerful because it has to be, it has to stand on its own without the support of any, any imagery. But um, yeah, there are just so many options. So yeah, that's a bit about the styles. How is animation different since lockdown? Um, there are um, some examples on the Leo website. There's an animation showreel, which we will give a link to, to everybody later as well. It's always, it's always difficult talking about animations on a webinar because we can't easily show show them but if you go to our website you can see some of some of the great examples yeah so um has changed in one respect since it's um uh, since lockdown is in that it's just more important than ever i think many people are realizing that as frank said there is a great sense of urgency in the need for communications to many many people as quickly as possible and animations are just great for that and people are really realizing that's that's the way to go we need an animation so it's no longer just supporting e-learning, but it is becoming the main communication channel for some of our clients. Um, and of course, it communicates learning messages in an engaging way. So people are kind of just going, hey, animation, why didn't we think of this before? <laughs> that's, that's the only really way it's changed. And why mixed media animation is so important right now, um, as Frank said, due to re production restraints, we're working to produce much more mixed me media in our fully animated work. Um, which means incorporating things like stock footage, selfie videos and webcam footage. Uh, we are aware that certain styles of content will date, so what's good for the zeitgeist isn't necessarily appropriate for future-proof content, and this is just something that we take on a case-by-case -case basis. We look at the audience, how long the, the piece is supposed to last, what it's for, and if it's for now and it's supposed to be totally COVID-related and putting people into this relatable situation, we might use something like Zoom calls and things like that. Not to say that they won't happen in the future, but yeah, I think uh, we just consider in each case what the best option is for us to apply that those styles um, and yeah, what the learning is trying to communicate. So in terms of scalability, um, yeah, again, it was really interesting to see what people chose there using a vendor or purchasing software. So yeah, the the first option that most people would have gone for in the past is going professional and hiring a moving image studio. It's great for scaling up quickly. Um, we even have to scale up beyond our team, uh, depending on projects, because it is one of those things where the demand arises very quickly. And we have a circle of trusted freelancers who we will bring in for those projects when they come along. Um, recently, we had to produce uh, 
I think it was five, six animations for Toyota uh, in North America. It was about to be July 4th holiday weekend and they needed to roll out communications to all of their staff, uh, thousands of people across North America in two languages, English and Spanish, just to give them safety guidelines on how they should conduct themselves over the holiday weekend um, without you know, getting sick. And uh, that was a huge success. And they were very, very pleased with it. And are now rolling it out to schools before schools go back. So we'll be modifying those for that audience now. Again, with a quite a tight deadline. I think they go back to school on the 8th of September, I think. So yeah, that, that was a really fun one to be involved with for us. And also, I think one of the reasons it was a, such a success for them is because it was at a time during the start of the lockdown not the start, sort of about halfway through when people were starting to kind of get really mental fatigue of just hearing all the facts every day, all the figures. And we had a goal to make these just fun and enjoyable and nice to watch and relatable. So we had this yeah, beautiful soft palette. And uh, what I was talking about before with the sort of hand made feel we we used a, a slightly lower frame rate on these so it looks a little bit more like traditional animation as well and a lot of kind of yeah fine lines that have been drawn in and yeah i think that's part of why it was so successful with their team so the other option of course is to go diy which uh, is amazing that that's even an option now and it's getting better every day so you can use tools like beyond powtoon animaker and animatron I have added a couple to the list in the last couple of months, to be honest, and I haven't even explored those yet because there are just so many coming out. And I think that's great for you in the end because basically their competition is going to mean a better product for you to use. So the secret to doing that is enabling your experts to create the content quickly. Um, one thing to note is, yeah, the quality won't be the same as a fully bespoke animate a piece from a moving image studio because you have obviously years of skills and practice um, and expertise at your fingertips with a with a dedicated team but you know if you're just communicating key points you have your experts content there and it's being presented in a more animated and exciting way than just you know a document or a powerpoint so it could be a quick win for you and um, what's next for animation? I foresee a lot more high level comms and engagement pieces, definitely. And we're already seeing this in the type of work that's rolling in because animation gets people on board and generates buzz for something really quickly. Um, there is more competition, as I said, between those DIY animation software companies, and that's just going to make it better for you. Um, watching the Titans battle it out and you will reap the rewards in terms of the features of the product that you get to use at the end of the day. So I think it's it's a great time for animation. It's a silver lining, an unexpected silver lining um, in terms of people uh, understanding the power of stories and how they can bring it into their work. Thanks very much, Bridget. And um, we've got some nice questions that I'm going to um, bring back to you in a second uh, and to Frank uh, that have come in from uh, people on the webinar, which is great. Um, before we come to those, I just want to uh, tell everyone that um, Frank's done a little uh, paper, if you like, on how to film great looking learning video at home. Uh, and the link will be coming out to you right now from Lindsay into chat, I believe, uh, or you can find it on our website. Um, he, there's also a full ebook on video, uh, including video in lockdown coming out within the next week or so. And everybody who's signed up to this webinar will will get a link to that. Um, it's it's looking really really nice. So um, I urge you to download that and uh, and look at it. There's some really really great practical tips there from the team. Um, so we've we, we've got time, a couple of minutes for some some questions. The uh, particularly around animation. Now there's one from Ethan that is uh, quite a complex question, so I'm going to read it out as it's written. Um, uh, and it's uh, in regards to animation. Um, do you ever wire animation up with logic to create an interactive sim e, um, x webgl example webgl assets that are user driven interaction 
No, that's something that we haven't really explored very much yet, but it's something that is just before the lockdown was very much on our horizon. We were kind of starting to explore the potential of, of web apps more, but usually with the with our delivery platforms, um, we we don't always have those capabilities. People's learning, people's LMSs aren't usu usually compatible with all of those features that are front end on the web. So it's something we're going to explore more of, but not something that we've been doing yet. Great. Um, there's a, a great question from, from Francesca, which is how do you know if your content will date quickly? Really hard, hard question to answer. Any thoughts on that, Bridget? I have some, yeah. I I think advertising is a really good checkpoint because when you start seeing something as I think it was a matter of weeks before in, in all the ads it was people using FaceTime and Zoom and you know giving each other hugs over a distance and and I just thought I can see a lot of this in you can just see it in advertising very quickly. But also it's just kind of thinking about it, thinking about how is our life different now and how might it be different in the future and I mean it's just usually just a matter of kind of following that logical thought process. I think we have from a, a video point of view we have um, certain sort of checks that we do with, with clients so they'll say oh, I've got somebody really senior um, to, to interview and we'll say are you sure you know are they gonna are they gonna be here in a year uh, and what if they're not? Um, so you know, I, I remember years ago, famously, we did a we did a drama shoot for um, a, a hardware store client of ours. This is 20 years ago now, and we had to redo the shoot because they changed their uniforms between shooting and and the release of the video. So we had to shoot it again with the new uniform. So um, you know, there's all sorts of questions that we ask and kind of check as we go through just to sort of flag these things up about shelf life, because obviously they're, they're expensive things to change. Very good. Um, and here's another one, per perhaps for you, Frank, which is a question for Paul White. Hi, Paul. Um, animation versus film for clinical training. Yeah, I, I would suggest that we probably do a higher ratio of animation than we would in a normal subject area. Um, there are just a lot of, of things in that in that area that are in, need, need to be shown in an incredibly precise way um, yeah. uh, that we can't really film quite as effectively as we can if we if we animate. So um, probably start with thinking about animation and, and, and see where that takes you. Great. So um, thanks, and hopefully we will get to your uh, will have got to some of your questions. Uh, the other ones we haven't answered and answered them during this. Um, Frank, do you want to give us your final um, thirty seconds, three video tips, takeaways? I can do. Would you remind me what they are? I can't see. Yeah. Me. Can we get um, to them? Um, um, allow more time and prep. Yes. Um, as I said before, I just want to reinforce that that the um, the, the prep time for these things is is enormous if things go wrong on the day in a conventional shoot you can send somebody out to get a replacement for something or you know batteries and things like that um if it happens remotely you're stuffed so you've re you've really got to um you've really got to pay attention to every every possible problem that might emerge to be honest um and that can take a lot of time uh the next one uh, except the limitations of lockdown um if, if people are working at home then um, you know, film them working at home. We, you know, everybody accepts that that's a situation. Embrace them, and, and I think it's it's easy to start to get too ambitious, um, and it's better to do something uh, with a sort of middle spec really well than fail at trying to do something complicated that we're just not set up to do at the moment. And trust your own people. Um, I think we're seeing more people from our client organisations taking part in videos, whether that's in front of the camera or helping with various facets, people will generally rise to the challenge. They might feel terrified if they haven't done it before, but most people actually produce a really good result with that help. So, um, you know, look, look to your own, own people as well as, as providers. Great. And Bridget, your final three tips for animation. 
Yeah, just quickly. So for a short turnaround project, hire the professionals. They'll just make it make your life a lot easier. When it's fast, the pressure's on. That's what we're here for. That's what we do. Um, if there is time to learn, embrace your inner animator with consumer tools. You can do it yourself. That's empowering and brilliant. Um, but for all comms, consider using Moving Image for relatable, memorable and shareable content. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Frank, Bridget, everybody for coming on this. Um, it's been a really, really interesting uh, hour. And um, thank you, Lindsay and Hannah in the background there for keeping everything going and organising all of this. Um, there will be a, a link to the recording um, and uh, any other useful links to uh, other things we will send through to you, um, including have a look at if the show reels on our um, leolearning.com uh, website under what we do, video and animation, you'll see two show reels there with some really nice examples of everything. Um, please do get in touch uh, with any of us if you have any questions that either we haven't answered or that pop up and we'd love to hear from you. So um, from me, thank you very, very much, everybody and uh, hopefully we'll see you very soon.